So we have our first question. Um, do you do we have a chart or PDF with printer settings um, for all of our papers that can be downloaded? What I would recommend is if you go to our website on the profile download page and pick your printer um, brand and then model, you'll get the chart on the web and then just either print that page or export it to a PDF on your desktop or whatever else. And that uh, that's the best way to do it. So we don't have them prepared as PDFs to download, but if you just screenshot that page, uh, that'll do the same thing. Cool. Um, so we have a question from Walter. I create abstract images um, that exceed color gamut of my printer, the Epson 7800. This is a particularly noticeable in some variation of blue, but also other colors. How much better are the current inkjet printers with respect to color gamut? In your experience, which of the printers, Epson or Canon, have the best color gamut? Got it. So what I would recommend is there's, I'm guessing, a paper or two that you use. So if you're curious as to how they might render, if you download the profile for that paper, let's say you're using the Intrata RagBright. So you could look at one of the new wide formats, the Epson P7570 or the Canon uh, Pro 2100. If you download the Intrata profile for those printers and then soft proof your image in Photoshop, you can compare the gamut warnings from the 7800 to the new printer. You should get a larger gamut on the newer machines because the Epson has added the violet ink, Canon has the blue inks, that sort of thing. Um, but it all depends on your your paper ink combination. So download the profile for the new printers, soft proof it, check it out, and that should give you a good idea if you'd see a big difference or a small difference if you upgraded the printer. Cool. It's a good one. I'm going to make you a little bit larger and make myself smaller. Um, <laughs> how do you adjust your ink and paper combo if you're already using ICC profiles? My black and white test page at the lowest percent is off of off of paper color by maybe 2%. So if you are using the profile and the matching media setting and things aren't quite spot on, um, if you look at a soft proof and the soft proof confirms what the print shows, then you know that you're good end to end on, on your color management and that everything's working accurately. At that point, you can't edit the profile at all. What you would wanna do is you'd need to, to edit your file for print. So once you've done all of your initial edits and and have it ready to go, then you would go in and make any color or density or shadow tweaks that you need to before you print, knowing on your printer exactly what doesn't quite match up. So there's no way to edit the profile, but it's just something you'll have to do in, in post before you print. Great. Can you comment on the Juniper Brita paper uh, they have used the Epson's legacy Brita paper, but learned yesterday that it's no longer available in sheets and only in rolls. So what is the, um, is the surface similar to the Juniper? So the, the Juniper is going to be a little bit warmer and have just a little more texture than Epson's uh, legacy Brita. They're, they're very similar. They'll be, they'll be very similar in a gamut and overall appearance and that sort of thing. Sheen is almost identical, but again, the Juniper is going to be a little warmer with just a little more texture. So, Great. and I believe if they email in, uh, what is it? Info at legionpaper.com, we can send out a couple of uh, paper samples if they're interested in trying something. Yeah, absolutely. You can definitely email us and we'll send you um, a small sheet that you can do it, do some tests on. Yeah. We have a question from Michael. Um, he has a Canon Pro 10. Every time I use eight by 10 paper, it spits right back out. It works fine on 13 by, by 19 paper. Any thoughts on this? Uh, if you're using, so are you, I wonder if you're using eight by 10 paper or if you're using eight and a half 11 letter paper. And so if you're using eight and a half 11, um, but you have it set to eight by 10, then the printer will likely reject it. Um, the other thing could be is if you're using eight and a half 11 sheets and you are using a fine art media setting, you'll need to use the US letter and then art margin 30. So the printer knows to print the wide margins that Canon requires when you're using a fine art sheet. But based on your question, I'm wondering if you're using the letter sheets and telling the printer that they're eight by 10. And so it's sensing that discrepancy. 
Right, because most of the Moab papers are eight and a half by eleven and not yeah, we don't, by ten. We don't so offer right. any eight by ten pa papers. So the next question: Which paper can I use for black and white? Do you have suggestions for black and white papers? So black all of white, our, all of our papers uh, will do well on black and white. The I think some of the best the Juniper Beretta does a lovely job if you want kind of a warm tone, more darkroom fiber paper look. The Slick Rock Pearl is a great choice if you want a real high key, high contrast gloss, almost a three dimensional look. And that's a that's a brighter white, so you'll get really a, a full contrast range. And then on the matte papers, they're all gonna be very good. It just depends on if you want a little texture or a smoother surface or anything like that. But I'd say Juniper and then for matte, I love the, the Somerset Museum rag. It has a, a fantastic tonal range, really good fine detail. I think it has a little a little more shadow detail than most matte papers. So I would say Juniper and the museum rag for black and white. Great place to start. Perfect. And then the other part to that question was asking if we have a paper swatch and we do. Um, again, if you email info at legionpaper.com, you can request um, a swatch book and that has all of our papers in there. Yeah. The next question, um, someone has stated that uh, destination gamut warnings in Lightroom are not useful. Do you have any opinion on that? Well, I think uh, I think print or output gamut warnings in Lightroom can be very useful if you're getting a print that that isn't looking quite right. So if you have an image that has a majority of out of gamut colors and you print that, it's not going to exactly match your screen because your printer can't recreate those specific tones. So if if your print pipeline is is set up correctly and you have the profile and the and the media setting and that sort of thing and you get the print and you think, well this doesn't look quite right, you can go into Lightroom, look at the gamut warning and see, oh, well that shade of purple that I'm trying to make, I can't actually make with my printer. So no wonder it looks a little more blue or a little more magenta because you can't actually put it on the paper, but you can see it on the screen. So I, I, would, I would disagree that they're not useful, but it, again, it all depends on what you're doing. So just looking at your file, if you're not gonna print it, there's no reason to look at a gamut warning necessarily, but definitely for printing, it can be a real tool. And the other nice thing that Lightroom has is if you're working on a laptop or a, another sort of smaller gamut screen, uh, Lightroom can also show you what colors are out of gamut on your screen. So there may be colors in your image that you're seeing in the print, that you're not seeing on the screen because the screen has a different gamut than the printer. So all things to kind of be aware of as potential challenges when you're trying to make a print that, that matches your screen as close as you can get it. Cool. So for someone that is completely new to this, um, they realize that they need to calibrate their computer to their printer. Do you have any suggestions for a device that isn't too complicated? Yeah, so you definitely want to calibrate your monitor. So what that does is that ensures that the colors you see on the screen are what the colors are in the file. Because in digital photography, colors are all um, numbers in a three-dimensional space. So we wanna make sure that the red on your monitor is the same as the red on the paper. And we do that by verifying with a colorimeter or a spectrophotometer device on the screen, the computer shows it a whole bunch of color patches and it reads those. And then if any of them are off, it does changes in the software so that then you know that what's on the screen is what the computer thinks it's showing you. Because if you don't calibrate, your screen could be in black and white and the computer says, well, I'm sending out a color signal and, and there's a break in the chain there that nobody knows. So the, the best and I think most affordable um, device is the X-Rite Display Studio. Let's see if we can pull that up real quick. And the other nice thing about um, about monitor calibrators is you don't have to spend more money to get a better one. It's not like you're buying a camera or a lens or whatever else. So um, buy the one that really fits your budget and then you don't have to worry about spending more and more money to get a better, a better screen calibrator. Let's see, i1 Display Studio, here it is. So this has a, a pretty good software. It's pretty pretty efficient. Uh, again, advertised price is only $170, so it's a pretty affordable product. And I would say, you know, based on on your needs and that sort of thing, usually calibrating 
uh, once a month is plenty. So just make yourself a little reminder or whatever. And that just helps because screens do drift or if it's a laptop and you're traveling with it, that's another thing. Another thing to be aware of if you're using the Mac, I'm not sure if Windows has this now, is Apple now offers a uh, display that reads ambient light and changes the color of the display based on the ambient light. You want to make sure that you turn that off because when you calibrate it, you want your screen colors to stay the same and not be changing whether it's morning or evening or you're changing rooms in your house or whatever else. So make sure you change that ambient light monitoring, turn that off. But yeah, so the i1 Display Studio to answer your question is what we would recommend as a, as a great screen calibrator. Great. So this is kind of a, a few parts of this question, but I'm going to read his entire question. Reed is printing with a Canon 4100. I make my own printer profiles. He's a little confused about Canon's media configuration tool. Uh, when to use it, useful for printing under Lightroom. What advantages to using Canon software for printing since he's so used to printing in Lightroom? Yeah, so the, the media configuration tool is something that Canon has on the wide format printers that allows you to make a custom media file and give it a name and load it in your software. So for most printers, we have our profiles and then we recommend, well, if you're printing Juniper on the Canon Pro 10, you're going to use Canon Photo Paper Pro Platinum as your media setting. Well, if you use the uh, media configuration tool, you can load your own paper in the driver called Moab Juniper Beretta and then you just select that. So really the advantage it has is if you have a paper that needs uh, less ink or more ink than one of the Canon media settings, or it's very thick, things like that. The other thing that I found where it can be useful is for, for us, the Slick Rock Pearl and the Juniper Beretta on the Pro 4000 or Pro 4100 use the same media setting, but the Juniper is much thicker. So sometimes if you switch between those two papers, you have to redo a feed calibration because otherwise the difference in thickness causes them to not feed correctly. So the media configuration, the custom media files are definitely not essential. If it proves helpful in your workflow to make your own, you can actually go through and create a custom media file without changing any of the paper parameters. So whatever the base media they call it, the Canon media setting, if that's working for you, but you'd like to have just a, a media setting named with the paper that you're using, you can go through those steps and, and do that and then either make your own ICC profile from it or you can load our profile in if you haven't changed any of the ink parameters and you'll get exactly the same result as if you were printing with the uh, Canon built-in media setting. Now, in terms of advantages to using Canon software for printing versus Lightroom, um, there shouldn't be any advantage in, in color or quality or anything else like that. Mainly you use the Canon software if you're printing profile targets because it bypasses any color management or for folks who aren't comfortable yet printing from Lightroom or printing from Photoshop, you can use the Canon software where all the settings are kind of in one place and it, it walks you through it a little bit more than say in Photoshop where you have a number of different windows that you have to put settings in to make sure that everything's dialed in correctly. But in terms of final output, you should get the same print no matter what program you're printing from. Great. This is a question from Matthew. I use a Canon Pixma Pro 100, and when I print on the Entrada rag as a fine art paper, it includes a 30 millimeter margin at the top and the bottom. Yep. On the Legion form, it suggests the other matte to use the other matte paper as a media instead to reduce the margins. What's the difference between the media settings, and how should he accommodate the differences? Yeah, so on the Canon, the Pro 1, the Pro 10, and the Pro 100, if you're using the other fine art paper media setting, the printer requires you to have about an inch margin on all sides. They've done that to avoid any possibility of a head strike on the edge of the paper. However, it can be kind of frustrating because you can't then print an eight by 10 on an eight and a half by 11 sheet. Um, with the Pro 100 being a dye ink printer, you can change to matte photo paper instead of other fine art paper and get a nearly identical output. So no issues on that machine going to matte photo paper. With the Pro 10 and the Pro 1, when you change to matte photo paper, the colors won't change, but you do lose some black density and some black detail because it mixes the inks differently. So for the best print on those uh, pigment machines, you are better off using other fine art paper one. However, you do 
have to print an eight by 10, say on an 11 by 17 sheet, because it requires those margins. So it's the trade off of how does the print look versus how much paper do you need to use? So what I would say is if you're if you're frequently using matte papers with one of those printers, you know, make two different test prints of a, an image that has some shadow detail in it and see if the difference is obvious to you. And if it is, then you, you know, really have to decide which one you're going to use. And if the prints look good either way, then you can go ahead using matte photo paper as your media setting and you won't have to deal with the margin restrictions. And they have finally with the uh, Pro 1000 and now the new Pro 300, they let you bypass that. So you're no longer forced into those wide margins when you're printing with fine art paper. Okay, the next question. I use an I1 display to calibrate my monitor. Which illuminant do you recommend to use, a D50 or a D65? Yeah, so what he's asking is D50 and D65 are different uh, white points in color spaces that we can use. Typically for home use, D65 is just fine. It's probably gonna better match the tungsten lighting that you have in your house and that sort of thing so that your prints are gonna be a little bit warmer maybe, but that's gonna match the viewing conditions and all that sort of thing. If you set your monitor to D50, it's gonna appear a little more blue than you're used to. But if you're in a, a high-end color management environment or proofing or something like that, then you would want to use D50 because that's going to go across the standards for the viewing booth and proofing paper and all that sort of thing. But for home use, typically D65 is going to give you a more accurate look within your home setting for comparing your print to your monitor. Great. Gary's asking Epson P600, printing in black and white mode, are color inks also used? Yeah, so Epson offers a mode they call advanced black and white, and that's in the print driver. So if you don't want to print with an ICC profile, you say printer manages colors, and then under mode, advanced black and white. And that does use the color inks because you'll notice in advanced black and white, it does allow you to tone the image. So you can warm tone, cool tone, sepia tone, all that sort of thing. So that's using, when you're toning, it's using uh, cyan inks or magenta and yellow to achieve that tone, but also on a straight neutral black and white, it will often mix in some cyan and some yellow because it allows it to expand shadows and highlights. But when you mix in just a little bit with a lot of black and gray ink, our eyes don't notice that it's, that it's mixed in any color. When you look at it under a loop, you can see the little, the little color dots. But yes, the advanced black and white mode does use the color inks to expand the the tones, I sort of the shadow gamut of the of the print. Great. What is the best workflow for printing black and white on Beretta with a Canon ProGraph 2000? Uh, let's see. Well, you can do it, it's it's a similar workflow pretty much on any printer. You can do it two different ways. You can either send a color image through and on Epson use advanced black and white or on Canon check the box for black and white photo printing. However, I would say the better way is to convert the file to black and white, which gives you control over all the tones, the shadows, the highlights, the, the midpoint, all that sort, of, that sort of thing. And then send that to the printer as though you were sending a color image. So use the ICC profile, use the media setting, and then you'll get, you'll get that nice black and white print. Granted, the printer will use some, some color ink in it, but as we just talked about with the advanced black and white, that's a benefit to you because you typically get a better looking black and white. Um, the other nice thing about is if you prep your file in black and white and then print it normally using a profile, you're gonna get a process that's repeatable. So if you use advanced black and white, you know you have to note all your settings or that sort of thing or else your print this week may not exactly match your print next week because you don't have a record of the exact settings. But if you're prepping your file in your image editor as a black and white, then you could print it this week, next week, a month from now, a year from now, and as long as you use the same uh, profile paper combination, you'll be all set to go. Cool. Hopefully that helps. I've heard several pro photographers say they don't need to calibrate max. Do you agree with that? I don't agree with that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so screens have gotten very good and we, assume that they calibrate them at the factory, but as a display ages, it, it shifts in color. And also you don't know 
what the calibration was done with or how it was done. Um, the main reason why we calibrate our screens is because then we know we're seeing an image that fits a set of standards. So if I have a calibrated monitor and I send an image to you and your monitor is calibrated, we should see exactly the same colors. Whereas if I prep an image here and I send it to you, you may see it differently than I've intended it. And if you're going to print it, you may make edits and then print it, and then you'll get a, a result that's not ideal. And as, as screen technology has improved, this is less of a problem. I know 10 or 12 years ago, I would get clients who would call and say, well, all these photos are green. Well, no, the photos aren't green. Your monitor is not calibrated. But I, I think as a photographer, and especially as a photographer who prints, that it's, it's critical to calibrate your monitor because then you know you're working to that standard. And if you don't calibrate your monitor, you have no way of knowing if it's off, how far it's off, anything else like that. And typically you won't see that until you start making prints or you send a print out to a lab and it comes back and you think, well, what happened? This is, this is not what I had in mind. So I would, I would say no matter what your computer brand or anything else, definitely calibrate your screen. And again, with, you know, software updates or anything else like that, it can easily change that calibration as well. It's not supposed to, but it definitely happens a lot. So no, I absolutely calibrate your screen. You know, don't, don't have all these fancy papers and printers and, and cameras and lenses and hesitate to spend, you know, $175, $200 on a monitor calibrator that will last you for a good long time that will take a lot of headaches out of the process. Got it. So Randy has been using Juniper Brighter Rag to deliver portraits and he loves the look. Uh, these are not framed or covered. Should he be concerned about the prints being touched? And if so, can you suggest um, an alternative paper that he can use? So any inkjet paper, you don't want to handle it a whole lot because as you handle it, you leave behind oils off your skin or, or lotions or fingerprints or anything else like that. Um, a bright, uh, glossy luster paper is going to be a little more durable than a matte paper simply because of how the coating on the paper holds the ink. But what I would say is if you're delivering prints kind of unframed, uh, put them in a in a clear cello bag, like the bag that the Moab paper comes in. Those are all I know from clear bags, and clear bags offers uh, an almost unlimited number of sizes. So definitely deliver your print in a in an archival cello bag. And if you have a stack of prints or a portfolio, or if you have a client that's ordered you know ten or twenty prints and you're going to put them in a nice box, put a little pair of uh, white gloves in there so that if they're going through their prints, it just reminds them, hey, put on the gloves, and then you've you've put that barrier between your hands and the prints and you definitely won't be leaving behind fingerprints and all that and all that sort of thing. If you're working with either of our slick rock papers and especially the silver, you definitely don't want to handle that barehanded because the minute you touch it, it'll pull the oils out of your finger and you'll leave a, a fingerprint behind on the paper almost, almost instantly. So you don't need to coat it with anything, but I would just say, make sure you deliver it protected and, and if it's a lot of loose prints, you know, give the give the customer a tool to properly handle those prints so they stay pristine. Got it. So Scott um, prints most of his prints directly from Lightroom, but at times I can't do print from Lightroom and open the Canon Print Studio software. There seems to be a slight difference in the look of the prints side by side. Uh, let's see. So I'm guessing, Scott, I'm guessing you mean that the final prints look a little different when you have them side by side. Um, that could easily because I believe Print Studio Pro uh, defaults to perceptual rendering. And if you choose a relative color metric rendering in Print Studio Pro, it does not apply black point compensation. So it'll kind of block up the shadows a bit. Whereas in Lightroom, you can do relative or perceptual. And if you choose relative color metric, then you do get black point compensation. So I would, I would guess that would be number one. Number two, Lightroom may or may not be going through the uh, Adobe color management module. And then Canon Print Studio Pro uses Canon's color management module. So just yes, totally possible that even though your settings are the same, the prints would come out just a little differently. And that's just based on how those two softwares are coded differently in the background. So I think I skipped one a little bit earlier. Um, this is a message from Antonio. I use Color Monkey Photo to make print profiles for my Canon Pro 1000. 
and sometimes the prints don't look great. Using maker profiles sometimes look better. Which is the best workflow to make profiles? Yeah, so the challenge with making your own profiles is that um, most devices at home, number one, you have to hand scan, which is inherently challenging. And then number two, you're typically working with a small number of patches. So I think the X-Rite studio that lets you make profiles I think uses somewhere around a hundred patches, if I'm not incorrect. Um, and this is important because when you make a profile, each patch is a point in that three-dimensional diagram. So if you have more patches, you have more points, and then colors that are not represented by a specific patch, the software says, oh, it's in between these two colors, I know about where it sits. So for our profiles, I use a patch target of about 2,200 patches. And that's read by a machine that is extremely accurate. So it takes a spot measurement of each patch. Um, you can do that yourself. However, taking a spot measurement of each patch takes quite a long time. <clears throat> it also depends on your printing workflow. So you have to make sure that you're printing those patch sets without any color management and you're letting them dry long enough and, and all that sort of thing. So while you can make your own profiles at home, I think that a lot of the home tools can be kind of frustrating and, and give you suboptimal results just because they don't have, you're not working with the right number of patches and, and the best tools and that sort of thing. So hopefully you are getting very good results from the profiles that we make um, because I endeavor to get those as perfect as can be. Obviously there are some differences in printers but I'm, I'm guessing you're seeing differences in the profiles just because you're, you're kind of at a disadvantage with, with some home hardware. Meryl is asking, is Lightroom better to use than Canon Studio? Um, I don't, well, I would say, I think that, light, that Lightroom is better if you want a photo editor for photo organizer. For printing, again, it's, it's whatever is conducive to your workflow. So you're not gonna get a noticeably better print from one or the other. Obviously, obviously, as we just talked about, there may be some subtle differences, but the bottom line is print from an application that you're comfortable with, that is, is conducive to your workflow, that doesn't make you wanna <laughs> pull your hair out or throw your computer out the window. Because uh, the goal is to make this a, a simple, straightforward, predictable, fun part of of photography because it's it's such a different experience when you print your images to hold them and, and look at them than it is to just see them on the screen or have read, just see them on your phone. Um, but no, whatever software works for you in your workflow is the one to use for printing. Great. Paul is asking about um, using the profile for, I, I believe it was, to go back down here, the Entrada Rag Natural. Um, he's finding that using a different profile works better for him um, to get shadows and skin tones is. You know, sometimes that works. Uh, your experience is kind of unusual because if you're using the Epson legacy fiber, oh, legacy fiber. So that is a matte black profile. Um, yeah, it's, you know, these papers for the most part are similar. So if in your workflow you've, found a, a profile on a printer that seems to work better for yours than the profile that we've created. You know, there's no, there's very few sort of wrong answers in printing. You know, it's like you won't break anything if you use a different profile or a different media setting or, or whatever else. So uh, likely with whatever your setup is or the tones in your photo or the age of your, um, Printer, I know some of our much older profiles for printers from 10 or 12 years ago are definitely not as accurate as the profiles we have now, mainly because the hardware has gotten so much better. So what we can create now to a level of accuracy we couldn't create then. So it's it's entirely possible that, that in your situation you're working with a, a much newer profile from Epson that, that maybe captures some tones differently. But again, it's sort of a happy accident. And if it, if it works, then uh, there's no harm in continuing to do that. Cool. What's the difference between sRGB and RGB? So what you're asking is sRGB and Adobe RGB. So those are color spaces that 
your image file is in. And, and a color space is just a, a bucket of potential colors, basically. And so sRGB is the smallest number of potential colors. And we have sRGB because it works on phones, computer monitors, TVs, everywhere. And especially these days, pretty much any screen will show 100% of sRGB. So if we, if we use that as a color space for the image, it'll look the same everywhere we go. Adobe RGB is a much larger color gamut. So on a, for instance, on a laptop screen, you may not be able to see all the colors in Adobe RGB. On a higher end uh, photo monitor, they, those are advertised usually as 99% Adobe RGB. So the advantage to that is you're starting with a larger number of potential colors because we want to photograph and edit with the best file possible. And then if there's going to be any reduction in gamut, we want that to happen in the print driver using the rendering intent. So lately, there's another uh, color space out there called Profoto RGB. It is by far the largest of the color gamuts. It includes um, colors that we mathematically can include colors that we can't see and that don't exist because the math has gotten good enough. So Profoto RGB will give you a nearly unlimited number of colors. Um, so the nice thing about if you're converting your raw files into Adobe RGB or especially Profoto RGB is you're sort of future proofing those files because as printers improve, uh, ink gamut improves, that sort of thing, we can make better prints now than we could make 10 years ago. But if you edited that file in sRGB, you're not going to take advantage of any of those improvements down the line of inks or paper or monitors or anything else because you've restricted yourself to the smallest number of colors. So you want to make sure in your, in your image editing application that you're working in Adobe RGB or if you want Profoto RGB. And, and that's going to give you much better, much better uh, files than sRGB. Now, if you're, if you're exporting for your website or for Instagram or things like that, then you do want to convert it to sRGB because that is a color space specifically designed for the web. And that will ensure that everybody that sees your photo sees it exactly the same way. Great. Elizabeth um, is shooting in color and then converting to black and white. How, how do I add a very slight sepia tone to all of her prints consistently? Is there a way to set this up in Print Studio Pro? There is. In Print Studio Pro, you can tone an image. Let me see if... Um, let me see if we can do a demo on that. I haven't done it in quite a while, but... Give it a shot. So we're launching Print Studio Pro. Which takes a few minutes. Well, that's a challenging layout. <laughs> Let's see, let's put that back to something a little more useful. That's a little better. Um, I'm trying to remember, you may have to look in the documentation for this, or maybe somebody can chime in in the comments. Oh, here we go. So if in your settings, you choose black and white photo, and then you go up to color settings, you can select different levels of tone, and then you can do a warm tone, a cool tone, or you can drag this target around uh, and specifically warm tone it or cool tone it. So yes, you can add a slight sepia in Print Studio Pro. You just have to make sure it's black and white photo as your color mode. Um, and then in your color settings, you can adjust that directly. And this will probably vary based on what printer you have selected. So that was the Canon Pro 4000. If we take this back to the Pro 10, which again, will take it just a minute. We'll see if those options uh, still exist. So black and white photo, color settings are the same. Yeah. So yes, it is possible to tone your image in Print Studio Pro. Well. Cool. 
Um, from Antonio, he says, I noticed great difference in black and white prints, um, printing from Photoshop or Lightroom from using professional print and layout. And Adobe apps look warmer than in the professional print and layout. I use Adobe RGB settings and apps are the same. So what's happening? So Adobe uses, so this is back to that question a while ago of D50 and D65 as a white point. So all Adobe applications use D65 as the white point in the print pipeline. So all of your, and, and take this with a grain of salt because most people won't notice, but everything you print from an Adobe application will come out slightly warmer than, than your screen. Now, if you have your screen calibrated to D65, it's gonna match extremely closely. If you have your screen calibrated to D50, you're gonna see a, a noticeable jump in warmth because Adobe's routing everything through a D65 color management module. Canon Professional Print and Layout likely uses D50 as their white point in the color management handling behind the scenes. So it doesn't warm up the prints at all. So you're, Antonio, you're, you're not crazy. Uh, you're probably doing all the right things. You're just, for your specific setup, you're seeing that Adobe does produce warmer prints than uh, Professional Print and Layout and possibly some other imaging applications that, that don't use the Adobe behind the scenes print pipeline and Adobe CMM. So no way to fix that in Adobe. There's no way to specify D50 versus D65. Uh, probably just keep doing what you're doing and, and print using professional print and layout or Print Studio Pro and you'll get the, the cooler whites. Christine is asking, what is Print Studio Pro? Print Studio Pro is a plugin that's supplied with Canon printers. Um, with the older desktop printers, it was called Print Studio Pro. Now they've redesigned it and renamed it Professional Print and Layout for the uh, Image Prograph Pro series of printers. So it's a standalone application, or you can use it as a plugin with Photoshop or Lightroom that kind of condenses all the settings onto one screen. So if, if we go to print in Photoshop, you have your Photoshop print settings, and then you have your print driver settings, and you, and you have to coordinate those. When you're in Print Studio Pro or Professional Print and Layout, on the one side are, are all the options for color management and, and media size and, and all that sort of thing. So it's, it's just a different way of presenting the print interface. It just happens to be Canon software that's proprietary to their specific printers. Larry's asking, any thoughts about using ProPhoto or Adobe RGB during processing prior to printing? Yeah, that's that's up to you. Definitely use one of the two. Don't use sRGB. Um, the challenge right now with ProPhoto RGB is that it doesn't usually do well on the web. So if you load an Adobe RGB image onto your website or something like that, it'll look pretty accurate. If you load a ProPhoto RGB image onto your website, a lot of computers may render it in some odd colors. I know I accidentally loaded a couple images a, a year or two ago and they came out kind of greenish purple because the web browser doesn't know what that color space is. So for, for future proofing your edits, ProPhoto RGB is a great color space because you're not gonna have anything be out of gamut for the color space. Uh, but again, if you're sharing it or sending it on the web or something like that, you're gonna wanna create a specific file in Adobe RGB or sRGB just for that purpose. But uh, no reason to shy away from ProPhoto for your editing because you're getting the most colors possible. Got it. And Curtis, I don't know if your question got cut off, but I'm gonna see if Evan can answer this. Um, he's using a Pro 9000 and that the right ICC profiles, he's printing in Lightroom and his prints often have a very significant magenta cast. Do you know what that could be from? Um, so a couple of questions. Number one, are you using the media setting that matches the ICC profile? That can be a challenge. Number two, if you're printing black and whites, uh, I believe the Pro 9000 was Canon's dye ink printer back then. And, and especially with the Canon Pro 100, uh, the, the dye printers struggle to make a neutral black and white print. Typically they either come out cyan or magenta. Um, and, and that is sort of in your printer's firmware. There's nothing you can do about it. The Pro 100 we have here in the office prints black and whites a bit magenta, always has, always will. 
the third thing is if you were having success before and now suddenly your prints are coming out magenta, then you're probably the victim of a software update that caused some color management issues. And you'll want to go either reinstall your print driver or if you, for instance, just updated Photoshop or Lightroom, go back to the previous version and see if that solves it because we have seen a lot of color management challenges with new versions of Adobe and Apple software. Hopefully that gives you some punch list to try. Great. Is there a difference between Canon Professional or what is the difference between Canon Professional Print and Layout and Print Studio Pro? Uh, solely the printers they work with. So Print Studio Pro works with the older Pro 1, Pro 10, Pro 100, and it may have it may work with the 2000, 4000, I'm not sure. And then Professional Print and Layout works with all the new printers. So the, the 2000, the 2100 series, and then the Pro 1000 and Pro 300. So it's mainly just a software evolution. I don't think they coexist on, on many or any uh, Canon printers. Does Epson have a plugin like uh, Print Studio Pro? Not that I'm aware of. I think with Epson, you're just, um, you're just going to have to use the imaging applications that you have that you normally print from. Do you recommend finishing the Anasazi ca canvas before you put it on a stretcher frame? Yeah, if you have the if you have the space and the ability to coat a canvas before you before you stretch it, it should help prevent it from uh, cracking where the the stretcher bar bends it around it at ninety degrees and. And typically, if you get it coated beforehand, again, that'll help it. If you coat it afterwards, it, you get just as much UV humidity scratch protection. You just may see a little bit of separation in the weave as you stretch that around the stretcher bars. Great. And I think I skipped one question earlier from Gary. Um, Evan, you might have to scroll down a little bit and take yep. a look when he see it installed here. the Epson P600 question. Yeah. So installed... P600 apparently. Ah, so Gary's asking, I think you're asking when you install an Epson printer or a Canon printer for that matter, they install Epson profiles or Canon profiles not in the normal folder. And that is correct. They bury their profiles in on the Mac in an application support profile uh, application support folder deep in the folder hierarchy. There is no documentation as to where those are. You have to dig through and find them. And once you find them, they're actually not labeled <laughs> what you would expect. It's kind of a goose chase. So no harm in leaving them there unless you're frustrated having a lot of manufacturer profiles on your computer that you'll never use. Uh, they take up very little space, but you you may have some luck searching online, or you just have to dig through the root um, library folder in your computer and and find anything labeled Epson in printers and see where you can dig them up. But it is it is a goose chase. I I did find them recently, uh, but they're they're pretty deeply buried in there. Great. And then going back to the An Anasazi canvas, um, what do you recommend to coat it? Because we do have that desert varnish spray, but he's not sure it's the right thing to use. Yeah, the desert varnish is a great spray for basic protection. So your your humidity protection, UV scratch resistance, that sort of thing. There are quite a few products out there in the market to coat canvas. And a lot of those give you the ability. So ours is a matte canvas. If you want to add a little sheen to it, there's semi-gloss print protector, there's gloss print protector. You can add a couple of coats if you want to give your canvas some depth. So it's a matter of, and some of these are, are roller applied, some of them can be used with an airless sprayer. So depending on your environment and your studio and what space you have to work with and what you want your final look to be, you might use a different specific canvas coating to achieve that versus just our desert varnish which is a, a standard protectant, but disappears into the surface. So you don't, you don't even see that it's been coated. And usually during our webinars, we do have a ton of questions about our desert varnish. So can you just quickly go through how it's used and what papers it is used on? 
Yeah, so Desert Varnish is a spray for specifically matte papers. We get a lot of questions about using them on a luster or a glossy or a baryta, but it's not formulated for that. Some people have had success, but I don't recommend it because if it doesn't work, it beads up on the surface and, and you'll ruin your glossy print. Um, so Desert Varnish is for any matte paper, and typically we recommend it for portfolios or books or things that are going to get handled, and it just helps prevent thumbprints in the corner or damage to the print as people are flipping through the book or other things like that. Um, you typically apply two coats. So you apply one coat horizontally, rotate the picture 90 degrees, let it dry for a few minutes, and then do your other coat perpendicular to the first one. And that ensures that you get a real even application across the page. It does dry invisible. Um, that takes usually 10, 20 minutes. And then you're all set to go and that print has been protected. No need to spray the back side of the sheet because what the spray does is it helps to seal the inks into the surface coating on the paper. And you can use it for the canvas as well. Obviously it's in an aerosol can. So if you're spraying to spray a really big canvas, that can be a bit of a challenge. And then lastly, make sure that you do use it outside or under a vent hood or something like that, because it, it does not smell that great and you don't want that uh, lingering in your house for a long period of time. No. Uh, Dan is getting ready to buy a new pigment printer. Any thoughts on pluses and minuses of Canon and Epson? So both are very good. Uh, the new Epson printers, the P700 and the P900, 900, I don't think they're shipping quite yet. Um, they do come with a built-in roll adapter now. So if you want to print long panoramas on roll paper on either of those, that is a possibility. Uh, the new Epsons also now don't require you to manually switch from matte black to photo black. Finally, we've been waiting for that to come along for a long time. So in, in that idea, Epson has caught up with Canon. Um, in terms of tech support, Canon has a much better tech support for their printers. Canon's support reps are located uh, in the States and typically have hands-on knowledge of the printers. The Epson support folks are typically in Southeast Asia and often have never had hands-on experience with the printer, so it can be more of a challenge to get phone support from Epson. Output is, is nearly the same between the two of them. Canon has the Print Studio Pro or the professional print and layout software we've been talking about. So mainly it's what printer works better in your environment. I think the I think the fine art media loading, or if you have a thick sheet of say cotton paper i think the fine art media loading on the canon is a little easier to use versus the epson where you have to flip down the tray in the front and and it takes a number of steps to get it loaded but the the best thing you can do is if you are fortunate enough to live near a camera store that has some printers on demo is to go in and uh and give them both a try and see how they fit into your workflow or obviously if you have a, a friend or somebody who has one of the printers go in and give it a shot um, and if there are specific things that you're looking for in a printer, you can always email in and, and I'll do my best to, to answer any specific questions about printers. But bottom line is they're, they're both very good, large gamut, good color. Um, not having to switch between the black inks anymore is a huge plus, but I think any of the new desktop machines are really recommendable. Great. So we don't have too many more questions, but I just wanted, Evan and I were talking a little bit before this webinar about different ideas that we can do um, after this Q&A going through the fall and the winter. So if anyone has suggestions and ideas for different webinars that you would like to see, put it in the chat and so we can take a look and kind of talk about new things that you want to learn and that we can definitely put on the schedule. But just going back to the questions. Um, so someone called the Canon support and was told they no longer support the pro 100 since they still some sell the machine. Do you know what happened? I would call back and talk to somebody else. That seems, <laughs> that seems odd. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Try again. Um, and some people are pointing out that yes. So the other difference that I kind of forgot about was so Canon printers use a thermal print head, which means that the head heats up and forces the ink droplets out. Canon uses uh, what they call a piezoelectric printhead where it runs a current through the printhead and a, a vibration is what ejects the ink droplet. So 
Typically in the past, Epson printers had a lot more clogging issues than Canon printers because as the Canon head heats up, it expands and it expels dried ink. I think that that has mostly been addressed with changes in print heads and, and ink formulations. We've had very little clogging of the Epsons we have here in the office. The biggest thing is no matter what printer brand you have, leave it plugged in and turned on and disable the auto off function that they often ship with because these machines will do sometimes depending on the on the printer a little uh, interval maintenance they'll do a, a nozzle check on their own or they'll agitate the inks or whatever else or mainly it seems that it it better keeps the print head sealed when you leave the printer turned on and then if you're not going to print for a while on either the Epson or the Canon every week or so just run a print nozzle check it takes almost no ink but it at least gets the printer moving, gets a little bit of ink through the head and just kind of keeps everything tuned in for when you want to come and do a print. So yes, definitely. Um, we had some clogging issues in the past. I think that's less of a consideration. And it is also correct that the Canons do let you swap out the print head whereas on the Epson when the print head is done, uh, the printer is done, you just have to go out and get a new one. Awesome. Okay. Well, I think we'll wrap it up. And like I said, um, email us with any suggestions on webinars that you want to see in the future. We'll be definitely doing these all throughout the fall. We have one on Thursday, actually, with a few of our Moab masters. So check it out. Um, it's all on our, our website, moabpaper.com slash Moab TV. So definitely take a look. Um, email us with any questions that we might have missed. I think we got to them all, but then just send us over some suggestions. And thanks, Evan, for getting to all these questions. Absolutely. And I see Elizabeth is asking if we could do a little video directly on uh, monitor calibration. So that's definitely a good idea. So we'll put that down and see if we can't address that coming up shortly. 